Org. I just saw one of my friends who I haven't seen for a really long time, Michael Patton here, and I think he just made, I twisted his arm a little bit, and I think he just, I think he just made a commitment to teach a class on Frontier Cincinnati, Frontier Cincinnati in our fall semester, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be great. So um, Empower You, it, it started uh, 15 semesters. Oh, so about seven and a half years. I think I've got a, oh, I'm on, I'm going on and off, but we had just a simple concept when we started Empower You, and that's to teach you about things to help you become more empowered in your lives. And that could be a many, many different things from getting educated about topic, new topics, to having fun, to getting engaged in issues around the community. We've got a, um, a session that we've added on November 29th, not November 29th, that's a little ways away, but March 29th, the library will be coming in here to talk to us about their big uh, levy that you'll get a chance to vote on many of you in May. Um, it'll be, be the first part of our session that night. And um, they're asking for a really big increase in your property taxes. They're gonna double your property taxes, their portion of it. So um, you should come that night and learn about it and get engaged if you're interested in that topic, whether you are you or you aren't. But just a couple other things I want to let you know about. All of our sessions almost that are in this building, you can watch online. I want to welcome the people online tonight. We've got some great new online software, webinar software called Zoom. You can watch it on your phones. You can watch it on your iPads. You can watch it anywhere. And if you can't make a session the next day, give us 24 hours. The session will be recorded, It'll be on our website and you can watch a recording. So we had a really fun class about, it was called Life Balance the other night. Anybody come to that? I know Ken came to it. We did a session, our first session two days ago. You can watch it online if your life is not in balance. That wouldn't apply to anybody here though, right? Um, a couple other things I wanna let you know about. Restrooms, if you need rest, restrooms, just follow the signs. They're out that door there. And um, I had a couple suggestions. Would you guys see, like us to have free food at all of our Empower You sessions? Would that be a great thing? Let's thank our guests, our friends at Americans for Prosperity, Libby back there. Um, and um, the most amazing thing happened uh, today. So we've taught 300 classes in the last seven and a half years. And for the very first time today, one of our classes showed up in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Um, <laughs> So that's 300, that's one in 300. And I've, I've got this sneaking suspicion why that happened. I can't be on camera when I say this, so. No, I'm just kidding. Um, my, my sneaking suspicion, this class tonight, my sneaking suspicion on why that may have happened is that later on in the semester, we're teaching a class about fake news. So um, I don't know if it has anything to do with that or not, but. Um, that session is going to be on April the 5th. I think the best journalist in this entire city ever, Peter Bronson, will be here that night to talk to you about fake news. I hope a lot of people will come. Just a few other classes that we've got before we talk about our speaker. March 6th, that's Tuesday, we will have Timothy Anglin from the 387th Air Expeditionary Squadron talking to you about what it's like to be deployed overseas, what it's like to work over there, what it's like to play over there, what it's like to do business over there, what it's like to be overseas in Kuwait or in, um, in, 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 in that area over there. Anybody hear him on the radio today? Um, it should be a great session. On March 8th, this is a real interesting topic. One of our board members, Joe Platt, will be joined by Greg Lawson from the Buckeye Institute. They're gonna be talking about the future and what it's gonna be like for all the people that are gonna lose their jobs to robots. It's called the robot next door. Sounds hard to believe really that you could be impacted by that, but the great Walter Williams on Sunday wrote a full column about uh, all the people that are gonna be displaced by robots in the next uh, 20 years. I think I've got some copies back there on that column that we'll pass out to you when you leave tonight. And then, so that's next Thursday. And then a week from that night, we're gonna have um, a movie night here. It's a movie I had a chance to see a couple weeks ago. It's called Appalachian Dawn. And um, 
it's just a really kind of riveting documentary. It talks about Clay County, Kentucky. And um, many people have referred to that as the most corrupt county just with epic drug use, every politician was being given money by the drug lords and how a huge percentage of the entire population became drug addicted. And it'll talk to you about what happened when, when a group of citizens decided to get together and take action and try to save the city. And it's a pretty amazing story and gives you a lot of hope if you're kind of interested in, in being active in your community that possibly, you know, you could, you could do the same thing. So if you want to sit back and have some popcorn and join us at the movies, we'd love to see you on Thursday, March 15th. So we, we hope to see you at a lot of our events. So I, I got to meet Ezra, who is the coalition's director at Americans for Prosperity a year ago. He was just super helpful and a lot of doors uh, here and, uh, bringing us a lot of connections. And when he said he wanted to teach us about Frederick Douglass, we were just really excited about it. Um, and um, so we're really glad to partner with AFP tonight. And with that, I'm gonna ask Ezra to come up and tell you a little bit about Americans for Prosperities, Ezra Escudero, and also introduce our speaker. So let's give Ezra a round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank glad you. to have you here. Thank you, Dan. It's a real pleasure to be back to visit. Um, I've been here a few times for some planning sessions upstairs uh, to be a customer in the lobby. And I've been on a tour of this location. I'm thrilled to actually be here for a program. So thank you for that warm welcome. And hopefully this is the first of many more to come. Uh, Americans for Prosperity, let me begin by explaining a, a minor difference here. Uh, tonight, I'm here representing Americans for Prosperity Foundation. We are a non-for-profit 501c3 organization, and our primary purpose is educational. We're here to educate uh, community members about the principles of a free society. And this is very important for a number of different reasons. If I'm not mistaken, I was at a, uh, I was at a presentation Today's March 1st, so two months ago, where we were talking about some of the challenges that our country is facing in terms of preserving these principles, uh, fighting for liberty, and making sure that this country continues to remain a free country, and that it continues to progress on its path towards greater freedom and liberty for all, which as we know, didn't start out, didn't start out the most perfect way and has been constantly leading the way in the world in terms of being that most free, most prosperous country. I was at this, uh, I was at a training event back in January, and I think this quotation is attributed to Andrew Breitbart. Politics is downstream from culture. In other words, it's important for community members to fight and get engaged on the federal, state, and local level politically to make sure that your representatives, your legislators, your city council members know who you are and you know who they are. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. It's important to be engaged on the political level. But my goodness, if you really want to make a big lasting change, you also have to be there at the cultural level making sure that some of our history that sometimes at best gets ignored, set aside as a lower priority for other stories that get told, and at worst is deliberately hidden from curricula in our schools, in our universities. The Americas for Prosperity Foundation is doing a lot of work to make sure that history isn't forgotten, those stories get told, and that we recognize some of the amazing contributions of women and men over the centuries to help build this country into such a free place. Now, one of our programs is called the Grassroots Leadership Academy. Again, educational focus, helping to engage people and teach them how to be more effective in the public policy process. Because the other side of the Americans for Prosperity coin is our 501c4 entity. Most of my day work 
is actually in downtown Columbus. I'm a registered lobbyist, and I spent a lot of time at the Ohio State House fighting legislation that builds barriers and promotes cronyism. Most of the bills that I'm engaged with that we're fighting uh, would make it harder for people to start their own business. Would it create more obstacles so that people who have small businesses now have to go ask the state government for permission to grow, expand, and to create jobs for other people to serve their communities. We're fighting for more school choice. We're fighting for criminal justice reform. So we're engaged on that level on our Americans for Prosperity side. And some of our Grassroots Leadership Academy graduates join us as well and get involved at that level. But tonight's educational in nature, and, and I'll give you a quick story about why it's important to be involved. A couple career choices ago, I was working in state government. I was a director of a small state agency, and we were holding a community forum. We had a state senator come in to speak, and we had about 30 community leaders from all over the state join the program. I already knew this going in. That senator was facing a hostile crowd. 30 people, all of them, were angry that the senator had voted in support of a bill that these different communities were strongly against. 30 people, angry. They were polite, though. So the senator came to the event. The room was a little bit smaller than this. Hostile crowd. Senator gave his speech, and when he was done, boy, 28 out of 30 hands went up. Hey, I've got a question. I've got a question. And sure enough, Senator, how could you vote for that proposal? Ask all of us in this room, and you could hear the murmuring. We are staunchly opposed to your vote and what you did. The senator maintained his composure, and he heard question after question. And he said, okay, if I may have an opportunity to offer an answer, please, was the crowd's response. The senator said, listen, let me ask you a quick question. I got a number of phone calls from the community, people asking me to vote for the bill. Can anyone guess how many people called me saying, Senator, please vote yes? 50, 100, 150, 200. 25. A state senator here in Ohio received 25 phone calls in support of a bill. He said, okay, you guys can figure out where I'm going next. How many people do you think asked me to vote against the bill? Zero. Yes, you win uh, some more iced tea if you like. <laughs> I don't know what prize. Libby will take care of you. <laughs> Zero people called him. I said, look, I'm not here to make excuses. Let me tell you how the system works in Columbus. And I'm guessing it's really similar in Washington, D.C. He said, most of my time is spent managing constituent calls and, frankly, working for re-election. There's a lot of things I got to do, and I depend on a network of people to help me make decisions on how to vote on different issues. It's like, I've got my own agenda. I've got staffers that are helping me process the hundreds of bills. Let me tell you, we're just over halfway through the current General Assembly in Columbus. They, they go for a two-year period. On the House side, they're already on House Bill 530-something. The sheer volume of paperwork alone. He said, I rely on my staffers to help me. He said, I rely on lobbyists. I know which ones I like and which ones I don't. And they come in asking me to vote every which way. And frankly, that's also a good way for me to learn. If they like it and they don't, then maybe, right, that helps me clue in. It's a whole network of things that I depend upon to make these decisions on how to vote. And another important facet is the public. People calling me. I promise you, there's 30 people in this room at, at that event. If 10 of you had called me to say no, I would have taken a real hard look at that legislation. 
No one called to say no. 25 people called to say yes. It seemed like no one was really mounting a strong opposition to it. So yes, I voted yes. And it's so important for each of you, we're only talking 25 people, for a state senator, a couple phone calls make a big difference. A couple phone calls you make to a couple more people to call a couple more people to call make a huge difference. Just a couple months ago, I was able to cold call some business owners and I found two people to come in to the state house with me to testify against a new commercial license that would have required commercial roofers to get certified with the state, to pay fees, another bureaucracy, more papers to push. Believe me, these, these folks are licensed and registered and certified enough already. The Industry Association is supporting the bill because they get to get paid to teach the licensure classes. The bigger companies that already have their clients established, adding 20 hours worth of work to, a, to an office manager to make sure their licensing is up to date, not a problem for the big guys. It's the smaller and medium-sized companies that, that are gonna be affected, and that's not by design. We had two business owners and then our testimony against that bill. The lobbyist for the bill had to leave the room. He was mumbling, not very under his breath. How dare these guys come in? That's the attitude. No one's been standing up to them for years. Three people come in, that bill has been iced. Now, we're keeping an eye on it. It could get some steam and re be revived, but right now it's been frozen because three of us showed up to say enough already. Ohio's been a state, today's a state, Ohio Day, right? Our anniversary is a state for over 200 years. Buildings have had roofs for longer than 200 years. There's not been a huge crisis in commercial roofs collapsing. Why now do we need to license commercial roofing contractors? So at any rate, it doesn't take many people to be involved, but you gotta be sharp, you gotta be educated. That's why we're thrilled to be working with Empower You and the work that's being done here to educate the community. It's part of what we do and it's part of what we're here to do tonight. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Ron Ferguson. He joined the Grassroots Leadership Academy from our field team at Americans for Prosperity. Um, don't hold it against him. He's actually a Floridian by birth, but I think you'll agree with me that he's really an Ohioan by heart. Uh, he's, he grew up a little further upstream in Steubenville on the banks of the Ohio. Um, he ran for state representative in 2014 uh, after working for five years as a television journalist in Eastern Ohio. Um, he did graduate from the Ohio State University, OH. I.O. Awesome. <laughs> Where he majored in communications and while at OSU, uh, studied politics, society, and law, and actually studied abroad in Mexico City. We'll, we'll need to compare some Mexico City notes. Uh, but again, Ron Ferguson, and before you come up, Ron, Libby Tabor, if I could ask you to wave in the back of the room. She is our local Cincinnati area senior field director. She pulled this event together working with the amazing folks here at Empower You. If you're interested in learning more about the Americans for Prosperity Foundation or even our sister organization and getting more involved, Libby's your contact. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. And Ron, are you ready? I'm ready. The floor is yours, yours sir. <clears throat> Fun times. Okay, cool. So I will uh, pull up some of this. Actually, the exciting part is we're actually going to start with a video. If we want to open up with uh, that first, we go with the video. Why are we here? What is it we're seeking to achieve? Why are we here? What is it we're seeking to achieve? 
extraordinary. We're here to break barriers this isn't just theory. because free people this are capable of extraordinary things. The human experience was this isn't just theory, it's history. For thousands of years, the human experience was full of misery, death, disease, abject poverty. Across the world, ruling classes controlled everyone else. They put up barriers that blocked progress in nearly all aspects of life. But then a series of events converged that started to liberate the masses. When Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1440, it gave people access to information and greater opportunities to think for themselves. William Tyndale translated the Bible from Latin, the language of the elites, into English. Those in power burned him at the stake for this act. But he succeeded in enabling far more people to be able to interpret religion for themselves. This created the conditions for the Reformation. New ideas began to take root. People like Galileo and Newton challenged authorities, which led to unprecedented scientific breakthroughs and progress for society. Events like this paved the way for the Dutch Golden Age. The Dutch created a relatively tolerant society for their time, and barriers continued to crumble. People like John Locke, Descartes, and thousands of religious refugees made it their home. Holland grew into a flourishing marketplace of ideas. In addition to scientific progress, like the invention of the microscope, economic progress was encouraged by the protection of private property rights. More people had more freedom, and for the first time ever, merchants, artisans, and working people were respected and rewarded for their work. Trade exploded, and Holland became the most prosperous country in the world. And finally, in the 18th century, the liberalism that led to Holland's wealth began to spread to other countries. In America, the ideals of a free society were reflected in the Declaration of Independence. It articulated a vision for a society where citizens would be treated equally under the law and provided the freedom to flourish. What ensued has been a period of unprecedented worldwide growth, known as the Great Enrichment. Depicted here as a hockey stick of human progress. By some measures, Americans' standard of living has risen by close to 3,000% over the last two centuries alone. This shows what happens when barriers are removed, ideas can flow, and people can have the freedom to innovate, succeed, and drive progress. But sadly, not all people have gained that freedom. Since our founding, the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has not been equally applied to everyone. African Americans and Native Americans were given no rights. Women and immigrants were only given partial rights. And certain religious groups were persecuted, just to name a few. Through our history, it's taken courageous individuals who built inspiring movements of millions of people to break these barriers one by one. From the abolitionist movement, to the women's rights movement, to the civil rights movement. These movements have helped our country move closer to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. But we have a ways to go. Today, our society continues to be plagued by a rigged system of cronyism, dependency, and control. We have a two-tiered society that creates welfare for the wealthy and crushes opportunities for the disadvantaged. The barriers this system has created make it nearly impossible for many Americans to learn, contribute, and succeed. It's the injustice of our time and it has to stop.
by partnering with an ever-growing coalition of collaborators from all walks of life. Our network has made more progress at breaking these barriers in the last five years than I did in the previous 50. In education, through principal businesses, in communities, and through public policy, we've built capabilities that are helping people transform their lives. Now, we must do an order of magnitude more. If our network can create a tenfold increase in scale and effectiveness, we can truly become a movement of millions that drives societal transformation. This will bring about a system of equal rights and mutual benefit, where people are motivated to help one another. This will not be easy, but what we face is nothing compared to what our historical counterparts faced before us. Their stories prove that dedicated, courageous individuals uniting together with shared principles and a common vision can break barriers. And when they do, free people will achieve extraordinary things. That, in my opinion, is why we're here. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so I was coached to just give a brief, brief uh, pause while everybody else online caught up to us. Uh, so why do we lay that out? Why is that the, the precedent to start the night? And the big reason why is because at Grassroots Leadership Academy, we've often talked about Frederick Douglass, who's the topic of tonight, and the way that he faced internal and external barriers. And you hear internal and external barriers talked about in that video. So rather than just doing a biography on his life, what can we learn from his life? How can we actually get real lessons that we can then apply in our everyday lives and be able to help our, out in our communities, you know, here in the Cincinnati area, larger in Ohio and across the United States. So uh, to start that off is internal and external barriers. Does anybody know the difference in them? Anybody think you can give me like a little bit of a description in the difference that a person's internal barriers or external barriers might be? Yeah, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. We got to do the microphone. Internal barrier might be a mindset or a confidence or a belief in yourself to do something different. Absolutely. So it's something, it's something that you believe in yourself. Yep. And uh, what about external barrier? Anybody want to grab that one? Were you putting your hand up? Did you want to do it? Yes, sir. Laws, absolutely. Laws, regulations, anything that the way that I look at it is if it external, it's going to be in your environment, right? E for external, E for environment. So it's things in your env environment, the outside around you, everything else would ultimately be an internal barrier. So for Frederick Douglass, he was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, roughly in 1818. Of course, nobody knew for sure at those times when they were uh, born, but he was born in Maryland. And so one thing that Douglas did not encounter very much of was internal barriers. He was really somebody that was self-motivated, had a lot of belief in himself. But at that same time, uh, most other slaves and even African Americans that were free did face a lot of internal barriers. And so does anybody have a feel on what some of those internal barriers at the time might have been? What are some internal barriers that was faced at that time? Sure, so we'll pass that. Yeah, sure, so minimal value, um, maybe the uh, inability to do a lot of things that uh, maybe white counterparts were doing at the time, a belief that you didn't have the ability to become educated. Yeah, absolutely, and that's one thing that Frederick Douglass never had. He never thought that even from a very, very young age. And so we move forward a little bit and we talk about things that were a little bit more prevalent in his life. So he faced a lot of external barriers. Of course, the real obvious one right away is what? Slavery. Slavery is the big one, right? Like that's the obvious one. Uh, in addition to that, we talk about he was taken from his mother. So at six years old, he was taken away from his mother. His mother lived on one plantation. He was put on another plantation to live with his grandmother. And so when you're taken away from your mother, 
and you're put onto a different place, a different plantation, especially at a young age, you can kind of imagine what those kind of external barriers might do to somebody and the difficulty that might be being raised. And so, you know, he was relocated several times after that. So he got moved around quite a bit. He was actually ultimately owned by four different slave owners. So he had four different owners in his life. Um, one of those owners uh, specifically was a very violent owner. And that owner is actually somebody that he got into an actual fight with, a real altercation, a fist fight. And he actually was able to beat his slave owner. And what was amazing is a lot of times that, that led to somebody being killed or something much, much worse. But fortunately for Frederick Douglass, his slave owner actually backed off and didn't do as much. And so he actually gained a little bit of respect in that regard. So he was, he was very fortunate with that one, that he was able to fight back and then, of course, not um, face bigger repercussions. And so the big one that I haven't mentioned yet about an external barrier, what do you think the biggest external barrier besides slavery in general was that he, that he ran into? Nailed it. But I'm gonna let you go ahead and read it anyway. No, go ahead. The biggest barrier Douglas faced as a slave at that time was education. Mm -hmm. So he had to do it on his own. Yep, absolutely. So fortunately, his second owner was the Ald family. And so uh, Mrs. Ald actually took a very liking to him. She, he was almost like an adoptive son to her. And so she, despite the laws at the time, where there's another external barrier, the laws, there were laws that said she was not allowed, even with her slave, to teach him how to read, how to write. But instead, she did it anyway. And so she taught Frederick Douglass, and he was a very quick learner. He learned the ability to read and write. And so once he was able to read and write, he wanted to learn more and more and more. However, after about two years and some other slave owners hearing that she was doing that, Mr. Ald said, you can't teach him anymore. That's it. I'm drawing the line. There's no more teaching him. So Douglas did something very savvy, very smart. He was an acquaintance, a lot of the white children of the slave owners. And so what he was able to do was when they wanted to play, he would ask them about their homework assignments and he'd ask them what they're doing in school. And so he'd ask them if they would want to talk about that and see about ways that he could look at their homework papers so that he could then tear down some of that external barrier, some of that education by reading and self-educating himself and getting prepared to learn more. So we uh, move forward a little bit there. Those are a lot of the external barriers that he faced while in slavery. He tried to escape two times unsuccess unsuccessfully from slavery. Then he actually had a third attempt and he was able to break free. What he was able to do was the woman that he was uh, courting at that time, she gave him a little bit of money. She was a free black woman and so she gave him a little bit of money and she gave him some papers that made it seem as if he was a sailor. So at that time, it was, there were a lot of, um, of African-Americans that were sailors, and so it was real common, and those papers passed. And so what he did was he went from uh, Baltimore up to Philadelphia, and then from Philadelphia, he was able to escape into New York City. And so when he got to New York City, what he did was he married Anna Murray, who was the woman that he had courted, the free black woman. And so they changed their name to Johnson. So here we are, it's the second name of his life, and it's still not Douglas, so it's Johnson at that time. And so that was mainly so he wasn't captured and so he didn't come back and he had a new, new name, new persona. And uh, while he was there, he also purchased the Columbian Orator, which was what he said the number one reading in his life outside of the Bible that influenced him the most. So this was something that he read over and over and over again. And people actually recollected that he could almost verbatim read the whole, give you the whole book, almost purely from memory. He read it so many times. He thought those speeches, which that's what the book was, a collection of speeches, was so powerful that he did it over and over again. He would do it in different tones of voice. He would actually practice because he wanted to be a great speaker himself. And so he moves forward, and he, uh, he also subscribes to William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator. So Garrison, who was a major uh, abolitionist at the time, was somebody that was giving a lot of speeches, and Douglas went out and met up with Garrison. And when he, when he met Garrison, Garrison said, I would like you to come up on stage 
did it on the spot. Said, Douglas, I want you to give your uh, story as a free or as an escaped slave. I want you to come up here and give everybody your story. And so he does, and he speaks, and he's very powerful and engaged. And Garrison notices this guy has a great opportunity to go out and spread this message and to further our abolitionist movement. And so uh, going off of that, what we were uh, ultimately able to do is um, see Douglas start to become successful. And while he had been a slave, he, be he learned how to become a ship caulker. So one of his slave masters had rented him out to shipbuilders. And so he learned this great skill. The problem was, despite being in New York, despite being in a free state, despite having this great talent, when he would apply at the shipyards, the shipyards would only give him a job as a general laborer because the people with the higher level skills didn't want to work with blacks at that time. They didn't want to work with blacks. They didn't want to work with immigrants. And so he was unable to actually do that thing to do that thing that was his best talent that he was going to be able to make the most amount of money with. And so they faced another real difficult situation. And that's part of how he started getting out on the speaking tour and doing so many speeches. And he started actually making money from a lot of his speeches, but he ran into more external barriers. So when he was out speaking, anybody wanna take some guesses on what the major external barriers, once he's free, once he's broken away from slavery, what are some of the external barriers on his speaking tours? He's part of the abolition, abolitionist movement he ran into. Anybody know anything from his life? Yeah, go ahead. Um, prejudice against him so people didn't want to listen. Sure. That's right. And not only, uh, not only that, but he would run into mobs, especially when he was speaking more uh, in, in the Western states at that time because a lot of people there had settled both from the North and South. And so when he would go there and he would speak, there was one time that he was actually pulled out of a speech and he was viciously beaten. And fortunately a Quaker family was able to, um, to rescue him and to make sure that he wasn't killed. And so he was facing that despite that adversity, he continued to fight back against these external barriers until ultimately he was being chased down by his former slave owners. So, they learned that this, Fred, this Frederick Douglass was the Frederick Douglass they owned, and, or he was Frederick Johnson at the time, but they said, okay, we need to go after him. We need to get him. So he fled to Europe. So he lived in Europe for a little over two years. He spent a lot of time in England and Ireland, and he spoke over there, and he spoke about the evils of slavery and these things that were going on in uh, the United States. And he actually was able to spread his message of freedom and gain a lot of support. And while he was over there, a lot of good people that became friends with him, pulled their money together and actually purchased him. So now a group of people in England actually owned Frederick Douglass. And so they then gave Frederick Douglass his freedom and he was able to come home. And so when he came back home, uh, we were coming up on the time of the Civil War and there was a big part that Frederick Douglass played in that. And so has anybody ever heard what Frederick Douglass was able to do now that he has torn down so many external barriers of his own, but he started tearing down the external barriers of others. What are some of the external barriers that he was able to tear down of others? Yeah. To give other uh, black uh, people more opportunity. Yep, and what, what were the big things? What's the obvious things there that gave them more, more opportunity? I guess, um, <laughs> I know blacks uh, fought in the Civil War, so maybe that. That's a big one. So starting out in the Civil War, there weren't black soldiers. And so Frederick Douglass became a um, advisor to President Abraham Lincoln, and him and Lincoln became friends. And he actually advised Lincoln that you should, use, um, you should use the free black people of the North to fight in the war. And so that was something that hadn't happened before and that Douglas was able to do. And they actually became about 10% of the size of the military and they were able to fight back. And of course they're fighting for their freedom. And what had happened in the Revolutionary War, it was a bunch of men fighting their, for their freedom. And now what do we have in the Civil War? A bunch of men fighting for their freedom. And so they were able to get out there and they were able to, to fight for that. And they were able to then get what the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, which gave um, black men the ability 
to vote, right? In addition to being free. But that's the thing. It gave black men the uh, ability to vote, not black women. White women also at the time not able to vote. A lot of immigrants not able to vote. And so that wasn't enough uh, for Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass wanted to keep fighting for tearing down those external barriers. So what's the next movement that he really joins up with? Ezra. Well, certainly we have his involvement and the involvement of others in one of the major political parties, right? Is that what, that, that was happening around that time? Mm -hmm. So he got very, got very involved, absolutely. He uh, was actually the first African-American to ever appear on a presidential ballot. He was actually um, the vice presidential candidate, first person, first African-American ever to be on there. So we're talking all the way back in the 1870s. But what he actually was uh, ultimately able to do was take up the fight with the women's suffrage movement. And so for equal rights across the board for women. And so that's what he started to do. He started to fight so that women could have that opportunity. And what was amazing is when they went to Seneca Falls for their first convention, and there were actually, a, when they talk about women's suffrage, there was a lot of women that didn't even want to put that up. They didn't even want that to be on their docket for women's suffrage, to be something that they fought for. And Douglas just couldn't believe it. And so he was asked by some of the women there that were really pushing for women's suffrage. They said, can you please go up there and can you speak? And so he walked up there and he spoke and he gave a, his, his speech of the importance and why it's so important to vote and why it's so important to him and why he's so happy that he can do this now. And he just wows the crowd. And so now he becomes a major leader in the women's rights movement, which a lot of people don't know that because he's known so much for the movement, obviously, to end slavery and to get blacks the right to vote. So uh, he met, um, while he's fighting in the women's, uh, women's rights movement, his wife dies, his wife of over 40 years dies. He meets Helen Pitts, who's a major uh, person, fight, a major woman in the fight for women's rights. He marries Helen and then Helen and then uh, the two of them continue to fight up until his death, February 20th of 1895. Afterwards, he was used to continually tear down more barriers. So, so post-slavery, he fought, that, fought to take down a lot of external barriers. But after his death, and even until this day, he's utilized to tear down a lot of internal barriers. And so using his life and after his death, how do you think he's been able to affect those to tear down the internal barriers. Yes. You can do anything you want to do if you have enough belief in yourself and if you keep trying and you never give up, you can do anything. And I think that's what you're trying to get to with his internal belief. Mm -hmm. So that's, yes, that's one of, one of the things. What, somebody want to add to that? Yeah, we're gonna come up here with the microphone real quick. I know, um, from personal experience, a, a co-worker, she said uh, her mom told her to uh, vote on a certain, for a certain party mm -hmm. because they were for poor people and we're poor. Mm -hmm. And I said, Kim, you want to be poor forever? You want your children to be poor? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, the internal barrier is that they, they put themselves in a certain place and they want to get more stuff, but they they are so much more capable if, mm -hmm. they, if they apply themselves. She, at first, when she started, I know a lot of folks wanted to fire her because they felt she couldn't do it. And I said to the, I said to the, um, <clears throat> the manager, the store manager, give her a little more time. I know she has it in her. Mm -hmm. And I tried to help her with that. Now, she's, <laughs> she's a, a rock star, mm -hmm. okay? and uh in what she does so uh, a lot of folks just don't realize what their capabilities their their mm -hmm. god-given talents absolutely and uh when they do then they blossom absolutely thanks for sharing yeah for sure and so when you have um after after his death do you think that um young black children that are growing up at that time when they see somebody that was able to have such a, a, a great education that was able to do so much, so much self-empowering 
of himself to become a great order and very wealthy for the time. At the time he died, he was getting $150 per speech. I mean, in the 1800s, $150 per speech is incredible. Yes. So go ahead. Yeah, so. I would add, um, uh, sometimes he blazed the trail and uh, so that uh, one of the internal barriers would be inertia that, uh, that many of the people look to him and follow him and as a role model and said, yeah, I can do that. Can be, yeah, they, they saw a lot of themselves in him. And so if, if he was a slave and he was able to, to achieve these great things, why then I, why am I not be able to do the same? And of course, they're able to. And so he also wrote his famous, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And then also he had the famous, uh, he had a very famous paper, which was the North Star. And so those things live on long after him. And so people are able to read those things and are able to continue to inspire them to do that, which is tear down their internal barriers, which is what's moving us forward to what about internal barriers that exist today? So if we're applying this to today's world and we look at the amazing things that Frederick Douglass did, what things can we do in our communities to tear down some internal barriers, either for ourselves or for others? Or what are internal barriers do you think that too many other people have? Yeah, back here. I think the example that Ezra gave with a senator only receiving 25 votes to actually pass a bill, and you think that all of the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that are in America and then all the different people we have in, in Ohio, and what is one person? What is one phone call? And an interior, um, I guess an internal barrier would be that I don't make a difference, and why would I want to put myself on the line for a cause? Because I might not make that difference, but if enough people get together and learn, then yes, we can. And maybe just 25 people can make the difference, but it, it's, it does make it, it happens. That's fantastic. That's, that's exactly what we need to look for. And you can, you can make such a bigger difference. Like Ezra said, and there's opportunities all around you to make that bigger difference. You can, you know, your, your one phone call, your belief in yourself that you can make that phone call that matters or reach out to that person that matters is really obviously a really big, big part of all this. Anybody else have anything? Any other on the internal barrier spectrum there? Up here, sir. Just the boldness to go out and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just take it upon yourself that uh, you got a chance to change whatever it is you're passionate about. Yeah. Whether it's politics or anything. Culture, society, all of those things that you have that ability in yourself. My dad uh, has this, I call it a dadism <laughs> that he says, but his, his favorite one, the one that means the most to me and the one that I think about every time that I give a speech or a talk is if it's going to be, it's up to me. And so I think about that all the time. So if it's going to be, it's up to me. If not me, then who, right? So you have to have that feel about yourself and encourage that to other people, pass that on. So maybe a lot of people in here don't face many internal barriers. Make sure that those around you, that they don't feel those internal barriers to succeed. Libby. An internal barrier that jumped out to me when we were studying Frederick Douglass a few months ago is um, how he overcame the stigma of not owning public, you know, owning his own property. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a huge deal for a lot of people today. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't own my own property. I can't, I'm trying to look for property myself right now. And that is something that I took away from his life. He really paved the way. He believed that owning your own property was how you, you know, grew your wealth mm -hmm. and how you um, shared that with others and impacted society. So I, that's an internal internal barrier I think he helped expose. Great. And so now that we know, oh, yeah, I'll pass it over here first. Yeah. About a year, year and a half, about two years ago, we had a program called on Frederick Douglass, and I was first introduced to um, a black man who was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Douglass became a role model for him. He became a Frederick Douglass Republican. 
right. and so I think for black people, especially if they want to look for a role model, he was one of the founders of the Republican Party with Abraham Lincoln. Cool. So we have all these, the, we've recognized all these internal barriers now in modern day society. And so what is maybe an actionable item? What do you think you can walk away from here and do in your personal lives to help tear down the internal barriers of others and try to help them succeed? Yeah, let's go up here. We're, we're going to wait. So what's something you can do to tear down somebody's internal barriers? I do it as well when it's good weather. I knock on doors and okay. I encourage people to vote. Mm -hmm. Their vote counts, that it's not just the president. There are people actually mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, they vote once every four years. Sure. The presidential election, that's the big one. But I try to get across to them how every election is so important and it affects their life. Yep. Why sure, am I involved in politics? Because it affects my life my friend's life, my children's life. That's mm -hmm. why I want to have, I want to um, influence those who are supposed to represent us mm -hmm. to do the right thing. So that's a real good example. So one example is getting, is letting people know that yes, your vote counts and getting them involved in politics. What about outside of politics? What's a way to, to influence people outside of that? Tear down the barriers. As a small business owner, I encourage other people to go after their passions and their dreams mm -hmm. because I believe that when you own something and when you put your blood, sweat, and tears in marketing and, and doing everything for that business, the ownership that comes with that is priceless. And so I give other people confidence to look for their passion, find out their why in their life, find out their purpose-driven life for themselves. And in the internal barrier that they might have for themselves, how do what do I have that I can offer society? What do I have that I can bring to other people? That's the question that they come up with. But then if you find hobbies or gifts or ideas or strengths that you have and just working through why you're here, what is your purpose? What can you do to make a difference in the world? It's really empowering to ed educate people and encourage people to have their own business and their own life. Yeah, sure. Libby, go ahead. I'm just gonna add to that. Something that we like to do as an organization is get out there in society and try to physically help other people break down their internal barriers or external barriers. You know, working for a um, other nonprofit or a food kitchen or helping teach inner city moms and dads how to make um, five healthy meals that they can go and take home to their children and, um, you know, all those types of things, getting out there in those different centers of community whether it's a, another community organization, your church, or anything like that, um, that alone helps people break down those barriers, both internal and external. Having that community helps you break down your own internal barriers, knowing that other people in society are there to help you. So. Um, explore, learn. Um, make it an adventure, learn a new skill, educate yourself um, on those things or on um, things that you already know. Become a teacher and teach. Uh -huh. To my mind, one of the greatest skills that anyone can develop is the ability to teach. Uh -huh. I don't mean the certified teacher in the classroom, whether it be teaching one or more and yep. pass that on because passing on what you know is very important. I, th I think that brings up a good point. So we should all be students all our life. We should always be learning. We should always be exploring. We should be doing more. And knowledge that you don't share is just knowledge wasted. So being able to pay that forward and be able to share it with other people and let them know. And so uh, I know my mom, she's now, she's a judge over in Eastern Ohio now. And, uh, but she, she grew up, she was the first person in her, her family to ever go to college. And then obviously she went on to graduate school and she's done the things that she has now, but she heard all the time that you can't go to college. That's not something that you're able to do. And so she never really thought that of herself. She thought that she had the ability and the capability. So now she counsels a lot of young people in our part of the state. And she lets them know if that's what you want to do, if that's your ambition, if that's your drive, you can do it. And just because you apply somewhere and you're told no, 
that's okay. It's just one step closer to a yes. And so she's able to use that to help other people realize their potential. So I think Ezra, you grabbed it. You know, if, if um, you're blessed with a little extra time or a little extra money to take your time and money and, and put it where your mouth is and, and, and get involved, you know, if, if you're pro-life like me, donate a little extra money to some of these great women's health care centers that are helping provide women with alternatives that they need, especially those stuck in dire straits. I can remember a few years back, there was an English only debate in Ohio. And I talked to the folks who were supporting that. And I said, listen, who, how do you think we're going to help more Ohioans learn English by making it the official language of our state or Let's get out there and get involved in some conversation circles through local churches, community colleges, universities, and meet with folks who want to learn English. It takes two sides of the equation and, and get involved and teach, teach English. Um, gosh, there was a third example I just thought of. Um, but getting involved and, and, and helping to solve some of our society's problems, because sure enough, the longer they linger, a very eager politician will be more than happy to stand up on a, on a stump, say, hey, I can fix this for you. And A, it never gets fixed. And B, we perpetuate the cycle of dependency on big government. Yeah. And I think that's a good segue into the next talking point, which is this, the discussion of external barriers. So we've really hit on the internal barriers. You talk about external barriers. An external barrier is for somebody not to know English. That's an external barrier. They have a barrier problem. And so you want to be able to fix that. And how do you fix that? You educate yourself. And so that's something that you're able to do is get a better education and to uh, be able to learn the language. What about other external barriers? What other external barriers do we see among people, especially our young people, that we might be able to help them uh, fight against? Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to give you the microphone, but what are some external barriers? Well, in certain areas, in ghettos or in poor areas, usually the public school system is not the best. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people want to have a monopoly on education. Sure. And uh, maybe school choice is a good alternative. Yes. Yeah, because so I, I live in a poor, well, I live in an interesting place, East Price Hill. Okay. And uh, the parochial schools, the high schools, they're an alternative out mm -hmm. of poverty. Sure. And uh, they, the voucher system helps. So, uh, you know, if, and, and I see a lot of uh, young mothers, maybe single mothers, that are so happy to have their children in, in, a, in a parochial school because the school is, you know, has, has received awards mm -hmm. and uh, their children thrive. There are other alternatives, charter schools, or a couple of charter schools, but there shouldn't be a monopoly on anything, including education, because there's no one, no one school for, for every child. Children learn sure. differently. That's all I have to say. Yep, so, so a access to more opportunities for, for kids, absolutely. So, you know, from the beginning of, of America to now, we saw a climb in graduation rates and more people graduate from high school, more people, more people, more people. And then it went the other way. And then it started going down. And so what things can we do to remo remove those external barriers so that those uh, children can go on and be more successful? That's a good one. Libby. Um, something that's facing my generation is a lot of school loan debt, school debt, um, because of the government regulations that are now causing um, education systems, especially state schools, to now make it a business instead of a true education, um, it's now a business. So, and just to add to that, laws in general can be external barriers and elected officials can also be external barriers that we have mm -hmm. to, as citizens, work against sometimes. And so another one is as people are trying to get involved in the workplace and try to provide for themselves and their families, there's a really good example. Some friends of mine right now in Arizona, they're fighting back against their state because you need a license to blow dry someone's hair. 
And so they want to be able to get this job that's going to be better than a minimum wage job. And all they want to do is blow dry somebody's hair. Now they can blow dry their own hair. They can blow dry the hair of their children. But they can't blow dry the hair of an adult that chooses to go in there and pay money to have the hair blow dry. It's amazing. And so it's a restriction. And we have one back here. I did, but then I kind of got sidetracked. I was thinking about blow-drying hair and how mine is so curly and frizzy and how right now. <laughs> and how ridiculous it is, but how real of an external barrier that is in our country and how many other restrictions there are uh, right now in the United States. And so I saw a stat the other day that's amazing. About one out of every four, about one out of every four jobs right now, you need a government permission slip in order to do it. Yep, about one out of four. In 1950, it was one out of 20. From 5%, right? 25%. Yeah. Okay, so what I was going to say that I, in my head went away for a minute. Um, I think of external barrier right now is just the political parties that we have that they are not even working with each other. If it's a good bill or a good plan, if it's Republican mm -hmm. or if it's Democrat, whoever came up with the idea, the other side refuses to accept it. And mm -hmm. so the communities and the country see so much infighting and we on the streets don't feel that animosity. And when you talk to other people, regular people don't feel that anger, but when you watch it on TV or the news, you see so much anger. So I think they're not looking out at the rest of the world, having normal conversations, but inside of the white house itself and all of the um, capital, it just, it's, it's very disheartening to see all that information. That's a barrier for sure for all of us thinking, what does my vote matter? Or why does what I do matter? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just have to say, this is an external barrier that I'm going through right now it, to build a sewer system. You have to be a licensed, I don't even know what it's called, but you have to be licensed by your County in the state of Ohio. And my husband is going to go take the test so he can build a sewer system on this future property that we hopefully can buy. But that is a barrier. Yeah, I just thought I would share that he's going to go take a test on the sewer system. <laughs> Septics. It was a free test. So uh, going on to that end, now, like we did with the internal barriers, what can we do to help out? How can you help tear down those barriers for other people, whether it be language restrictions or restrictions to be able to provide for your family access to resources. Maybe it's money. Maybe people don't have the right amount of money. So what kind of things can we do? What are things we can do to correct that, the external barrier side of things? And, use, and using uh, Frederick Douglass. I'll take a stab station. without knowing anything about Frederick Douglass's life. Um, he seemed to uh, take the attitude it's easier to um, Ask for forgiveness and ask for permission. He just seemed like he went ahead and did things and suffered the consequences. Uh, is that a fair statement, do you think? He, he suffered a lot of consequences. I mean, yeah. being beaten by masters, being recaptured, being uh, the mob that we talk about and having to do a lot of those things. And so absolutely, um, even, his, even his last uh, wife, when... Uh, was a white woman. So his sex, so he had two wives, his first wife, she passed away. And then his second one was a, the women's rights activist. And so um, there was a major stigma on that at the time. And so he had to, he had to deal with that until the day that he died. And so he was the great Frederick Douglass, this person that had garnered all of this respect over the course of his lifetime for so many good things. And then people weren't able to accept the person that he ended up marrying. And so, yep. So I don't think he really cared what other people thought too much, right? Was he a man also that was very, very grateful for the opportunities that he was given? I don't know if I could speak on behalf of him. <laughs> really? I'm, not, I'm not really sure, but I, but I, know, there, I know that also um, many years later, so Anna Ald, which was the daughter of um, the Ald family who was his second owner, he actually uh, met with her on, at, at her request and uh, she basically wanted to apologize for her father being a slave owner, and she didn't agree with it because she was an abolitionist. And so Frederick Douglass went and met with her, and a lot of people gave him a hard time for that. They said, how can you go there and forgive somebody for such atrocities? 
and so he used it as a an, an example of saying like this this person's committed no wrongs this child's committed no wrongs and she's trying to do something right and i think that you need to come to things from a place of love so that was a really well documented situation where frederick Douglass led by by example he also seemed to with what you just said he had a tremendous capacity to forgive uh, mm -hmm. people and for sure move on with his life without harboring all the resentments that he could have harbored which mm -hmm. would have probably have, you know impeded his greatness and would have been internal barriers that he created himself so he would have put up these roadblocks for so many great things that he did if if he looked at only himself rather than the bigger picture, which was advancing not only for, um, you know, not only for blacks, but for uh, women and for other later immigrant groups that came into the United States. So that was a really big part of it. We'll go up here. Sir first, since you haven't gone yet. Um, You'll go next. We're just, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, one thing that struck me from your talk was about these external barriers that he encountered, but at least three times it took direct uh, physical action by people to help him overcome those barriers. The one thing that you mentioned uh, was his future wife helped him to escape, gave him money. Another time was when he fled the country to Europe. It was friends of his who purchased his freedom and enabled him to come back to the United States where he could do even more. And the third time that you mentioned was when a mob was attacking him and this Quaker family saved him and gave him refuge. Oh, there was another one? The slave owner's wife. Yes, you're right. So there's four times direct physical, it takes physical direct action by us. We, we've got to get really involved on a personal level yes. to do, do this. <laughs> and, and one more that, we, that I didn't point out directly, but when he wrote his autobiography the first time, um, both an internal and an external barrier, this was one of the few internal barriers that I guess Frederick Douglass did have, was Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison said, you, sh you can write a book, you don't need to just read books. I want you to write your autobiography. And then on the external side, he helped him with the financial side of things to publish his autobiography and to get it out there. So you're right. And, and I was gonna close with that. So I'm happy that you were the A student for the night and you knocked it out of the park. Yes, that deserves a round of applause. So there were so many people that got involved in, in Frederick Douglass, Douglass's life on the external barrier side right, that were, that were able to do those kind of things. And, and the things that he was able to do, like tear down President Lincoln's internal barrier of thinking that, um, that African Americans can't be in the, in the service, right? And him saying, yes, they can, don't have that mental thought. Let's try it and let's do it. So he led by example. So people helped him and he helped others. And I think that's the important thing we have to remember is that we have to fight for one another and that we have to uh, make sure that we're paying it forward. Anybody else with their hand up in the back? I thought I saw, we got another one up here. Just a quick comment, back, piggybacking off of uh, your comment about Douglas influencing Lincoln to include uh, black fighters in the, um, the Northern Army. He also agitated Lincoln to free the slaves. And so it's well documented that, yes, slavery was a ma major part of the Civil War, but another major part was obviously states' rights. And so uh, he, Frederick Douglass played a major part in, in the fact that the North, that the Union didn't forget that slavery, in addition to state rights, is a major reason why this war is going on and fought. And in fact, despite being friends with Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass admitted that in, that in uh, 1864, he didn't vote for, for Lincoln in his reelection. He didn't vote for him. And the reason why was because there were a couple things that uh, Lincoln turned, turned away from. And one of the things was giving women the right to vote. And he didn't think it went far enough. And he thought that women should have been included, not just black men, but black women should have been included. And white women, of course, should have been added into it. So that was a major thing. So he voted against his friend. And then Lincoln did, uh, didn't hold against him because he, he still kept him within 
advisory roles. I think one more up here. I learned from Kay Carl Smith and Alan McIntyre, who are Lincoln, uh, who are uh, Frederick Douglass Republicans. Sure. Frederick Douglass had four principles. Number one, respect the Constitution. Number two, respect the founders. Now, he knew, I'm sure, that some of the founders were slave owners, mm -hmm. but he saw beyond that. He saw them as products of their environment, but that they had a goal in the future. And that's why they put the amendment process in the Constitution. And their goal was if, that all men are created equal, therefore all men should be free. Mm -hmm. And that was very insightful of him, very profound. And the third one was uh, um, local government. You can do you a lot by influencing your local government. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is the most important one of all, personal responsibility. There is one party, you know, we're talking about why don't the parties work. There's one party that, that feeds, pushes buttons and feeds on victimization, okay? You can't do anything because they stopped you, okay? For whatever reason. And then there's another party not all of them, but most of them uh, say, this is a land of opportunity. You could be whatever you wish to be. Just, just grab it, okay? You may have to work hard, maybe harder than the others, mm -hmm. but you can achieve your uh, dreams. Cool. And uh, I'm hoping that the other party that's, that's gaining power by victimizing people get over that and start really trying to help the American people. And then I think we can work together. And That's importantly, the people say. in this room, yeah. we, we control the one thing we can and we don't let, we don't have that internal barrier and that, that we think that only they can make a difference, but we remember that we can make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And that those people in office, they're the same as us, they're just people and that we need to influence. Yeah, that's right. And so I think the, the last point I wanna make on what you said there is the second thing that was really interesting, the four principles of Douglas. You talk about the importance of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, was another opportunity within his life where he could have let an internal barrier block him, but he chose not to, was he was invited to speak at a lot of 4th of July Independence Day speeches. And so he always said to others, that that isn't until after the Civil War, of course, but prior to the Civil War, he didn't look at Independence Day as independence for him. There, he, he didn't have freedom. There wasn't freedom for his brothers and his sisters. So that isn't his Independence Day, that's yours. But rather than be spiteful, he showed tremendous humility and took the, that stage anyway and spoke anyway at those events because he knew it was part of the greater picture, which was that was a platform for him to speak to further the abolitionist movement. So he did that. So it's pretty incredible. And so uh, I, I think you all nailed all of this. I, want, I would want to uh, read this real quick. It's our network vision. It kind of ties it all back in together as we get out there in our communities. And so I'll share it with you afterwards if anybody's interested, but it's, we support a society of mutual benefit, a free and open society that fosters long-term peace, human dignity, and well-being, where people succeed by helping others to achieve such a society where all people have the greatest opportunity to realize their potential and find fulfillment, we must eliminate internal and external barriers that prevent individuals from improving their lives. As we do, individuals will transform their lives and in doing so, help transform society. So I hope that you all might be able to recognize that and get out there and the opportunity to do it. And if you could just play our last video, this just shows you what I get to go out and do a little bit and speak to some other people. And if you have questions, you can ask me afterwards. We have a view of politicians as though they don't listen. You're the little guy up against big government. Many times they just need to be educated. I think America was really founded on citizen activism. That's such a... 
I think core America concept of really who we are as a nation. Even one person That's can make a, a difference. It's just a matter of standing up and saying what you feel. If you're tired of screaming at the TV, now's the perfect time to become part of an organization that will help you impact what you see on TV. The Grassroots Leadership Academy is a program that's designed to help citizens become better activists and become leaders within their community. It's a free program in which this organization is actually investing in local activists. The idea is to bond those folks together and to be able to meet like-minded people that believe in the same thing that you believe and then be able to go out and actually exercise on those beliefs. Grassroots Leadership Academy is the answer to anyone who wants to close the gap of the political process. This program teaches you the knowledge and skills and tactics you need to mobilize people like yourself in your community and then advance freedom in your town, your city, your state, your county. They provided some real practical tools that you actually use. Some of the issues that we've engaged on had success on include collective bargaining reform and decreasing onerous regulations. We've had people win local tax fights. We've had people run for office. We launched the Grassroots Leadership Academy in 2015. We've already had thousands of people go through that program. In terms of people who believe in limited government, economic freedom, free and open societies, there hasn't been this kind of advocacy and accountability. GLA travels to you. They're willing to come out to your community and help you gain the skills in your home. Currently, the program is operating in more than 30 states. We will create a nationwide network of communities of self-identified activists that will stand up and fight for limited government, free enterprise, the principles that we all believe in. I don't have to depend on anyone to make a difference. I have the tools now to make a difference for others. This training will be one of the tools that will serve you best in your fight for freedom. One of the tools that will serve you best in your fight for freedom. So I'm going to stick around, but I'm going to pass the uh, torch on to whoever uh, wants to come up and close things. But I do want to say that Empower You uh, deserves a great round of applause for helping tear down external barriers, right? For being educators and bringing people together. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And, um, thanks to Ron. Let's give Ron a round of applause. Um, for a very empowered uh, presentation. You know, the whole subject of licensure is such an important subject. You don't think about it a lot. There's another group that I was involved in kind of way back when that takes that on too called the Institute for Justice. And the amount of regulations that's put on, that is put on everyday people by the amount of licensing that they have to get, it's just staggering. It's so good to know that uh, AFP is involved in that. It really is such an important uh, issue that kind of goes under the, under the radar. Um, just a couple other things, super quick. I wanna introduce our Empower You team. We've got Mr. Bill Roll back there, who's our treasurer. Thank you, Bill. We've got um, Betty. Overstreet, who's our community relations director. We have got uh, Andy Scarth and Jay Grunke, who are our producers. And uh, we've got the incredible Nita Thomas, our executive director. Um, and we've got our little give giveaway. So if you've got a blue ticket, grab it. We forgot to do that. And we will let our speaker draw a number. And Ron, where did you tell us you, you were center now? Are you in Columbus or? Uh, no, so I actually live in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. And you, are you, well, thank you for joining us tonight. That's even better. Let's give him one more round of applause. Um, last three numbers on the blue ticket are numbers three, four, six. Three, four, six for a nice uh, water. He can't, he can't. Oh, come on. We're, we're going we're gonna to let him win as long as he introduces himself. John Tabor. Okay, John. Congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully you don't have uh, 10 of those sitting around. So 
Everybody, thanks for coming tonight. We're really glad you could join us. And uh, we hope to see you Tuesday for our session on an airman's perspective. And then Thursday, take a look in the future for the robot next door. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.